Welcome to Multifamily Insights. I'm your host, John Kasman, and I'm excited about today's episode. Hey, if this is your first time listening to the show, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss a future show. And if you're a returning listener, leave us a rating and review so we can learn what you like about the show and how we can make it work a little bit harder for your investing needs. Now, today we've got a good one. We're going to be talking to Jonathan Green. Jonathan Green is a lifelong real estate investor, concierge agent, and an on-market team leader. And he also is the founder of Streamline Properties, which helps source off-market deals in New Jersey and other cities across the country. Let's welcome to the show, Jonathan Green. Uh, John, thanks so much for having me. I'm actually a big listener of the show, so it's really an honor to be on. Hey, I'm always happy to hear that. And I'm excited to talk to you today. I went over your bio at a very high level. I skipped over a bunch of stuff, but take one minute and give us a little bit more context on your background. Yeah. So I actually grew up as a child going with my dad on investment appointments. He was an attorney, but a a very, very avid investor. And we would go to yard sales all weekend, looking at foreclosures. I would be climbing through the window, opening the doors. Uh, So I was really learning everything about investing before I had any idea what was going on. And as I got older and after he passed away, I had started investing on my own when I was about 18, but I really started to take in all the principles he taught me. And now I'm taking those and putting them full on into my own business um, all the time. I also have a background as an attorney. I was a practicing attorney for 10 years. uh, And that really helps me in the negotiation aspects of off-market and on-market deals, uh, just because the stakes are so much lower in real estate. So to me, when I'm on a negotiation, it's really not that big a deal if I lose a deal. I've been involved in you know much higher stakes. So I think that makes it a little easier for me to take it or leave it, which seems to help the way that I do business. Talk about that just a little bit more, right? Because negotiations is the one thing that concerns a lot of people, especially if you're trying to go off market. You know, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's one thing to just to have a, an agent and you just tell your agent, "Hey, I want to make this offer. What do you think?" And you go do that. But when you're going, you know, direct to owner, and it's just you and the owner, you don't have that intermediary. That negotiation can be kind of intense for some people, and it's probably a reason people say, "Hey, you know what? I don't want to do that. I want to work with an agent." Talk to me a little bit more about negotiation and just some of the skills that you developed. Yeah, uh, great. I I mean, all negotiation starts uh, by building a relationship. Uh, It doesn't even matter if it's adversarial. But you know, because I worked in adversarial uh, businesses before, this isn't adversarial. Everything to me is building a relationship to create a win win proposition. And that's how I market in my mailers. It's how I talk when I'm on site. I don't start going in with, hey, I've got cash, sell me your property every seller has a different proposition. And that's for multifamily as well. The mom and pop owner of something for 30 years is not the same play as someone who's in pre-foreclosure. You can't use the same dialogues. They're totally different sellers. So for me, my job is to learn as much as I can. And then I wouldn't even call it leverage, but I use what information I get with them and how much I can build the relationship prior to getting in the door uh, to then have a full discussion. So for me, I do. I try to get way more contact instead of just setting the appointment. I'd like to know a little bit more going in because then when I get there and I remind them that I know they're moving to Florida and their kid's going to be there, they already know like, wow, actually that guy was paying attention. And I think that's a big difference from what I do and how I coach and what I'm looking to do is I'm really looking to make a win-win off market and not, you know, steal the best deal. I'm happy to pay them what makes sense, but I explain to them very detailed, like I'm an investor, not paying you market value. If you want to do that, I can list your property, which is why it's great that I have a license. But I explain to them like, this is part of the job, but I'm happy to find a win-win number that works for both of us. Yeah, just you just gave some great insights there, right? You and some of it was subtle, so people may have missed it, but I want to play it back. One, you said, first of all, you have to approach this differently. If you're approaching a mom and pop owner of a multifamily property that for the most part is doing well, it's performing well as a multifamily property, but there's some value that you could create. That's going to be very different than someone who's in pre-foreclosure. So the cash offer day one, I can fix your problem now. That's not going to work with someone who may not even realize they have a problem, right? If they've got a great cash flow multifamily, your cash offer is not going to motivate them. So you talked about taking the time to listen, build the relationship, get to know them. If they say that they're going to be moving to Florida and their kid's going to live there, you got to understand those things and use that information to help you form the best offer for that client or for that potential seller. And that's really important because I think a lot of people, when they try to go direct to owner, they forget the, the differences here in multifamily. You cannot treat this just like 
it's a single family house pre foreclosure listing or whatever. It's not, it's a very different buyer, very different seller. I mean, in a very different situation you're walking into. Um, If you could give like, you know, one more insight on just that process negotiation, maybe something that you do that you teach some of your clients, give me something else here that people can learn from. Yeah, I think this will be really helpful. So to me, there's a big difference between single family and multifamily off market marketing. And I think there's a lot of, you know, just investors who are just, you know, they're doing what they should. They're sending out a bunch of postcards. They get a contact. When you go into a multifamily, one, it's different. First of all, is the owner house hacking? That's your first thing. Are they living there? If they are, great, because you know you're going to get a vacant unit, which actually makes it much easier for you to turn around and wholesale or sell the deal because you have a vacant unit. However, most of these contacts are going to be absentee owner landlords because those are going to be ones who want to get rid of their property, especially after COVID. You're dealing with tenancies. So my job when I go into a multifamily off market is, is the owner going to meet me? Great. If not, can I develop a relationship with the tenants while I'm there? Because my relationship with the tenants as a prospective buyer is very, very important. It's very important if I'm going to buy it for myself. And it's very important if I'm going to either wholesale or market the deal as a listing, because access is very hard to get when there's tenants in. So if you're trying to move the deal, and even if you're trying to buy it, you want to make sure you find out what's going on. So for me, I if the owner's not there, if they have a conduit or property manager showing me the property, I ask every all the questions of the tenants. Hey, how's the landlord? How's everything going? You know, is there anything you would do different? Is there anything that's really a major eyesore? Because then I can take that and use it against the seller of the property uh, to say like, well, they say you haven't fixed this in, in that long. But especially as you go like cash for keys, what most people you know used to call cash for keys, which is buying the tenants out of the property so you can get it vacant, just not available anymore after COVID. It, like in New Jersey, we can't get anybody out. So you really can't rely on that and just say, oh, it's no big deal. I'll buy this multi. I'll just kick the tenants out. You're not kicking the tenants out. So you you have to deal with what you have there. And because I'm licensed, sometimes we can get them, move them to another property, but that's even difficult now. So I really think you're evaluating a multi much differently uh, because there could be tenants who don't want to leave. They're usually paying under market value. So why would they want to leave? They're in a great spot. It's under market value. And you really have to massage those relationships, I think, to be effective off market on multis. And that scales up even to the more units you have. It's just that that mom and pop tendency is is much more important because they always let them go. Part of the reason they probably want to let go of them is because it's under market and they're embarrassed to try to get a, a rent raise or they can't get it. Yeah. And dealing with those residents and letting them know, hey, we're gonna, we got to push your rents up so yeah. much. It's a tough. And again, go back to negotiation. A lot of people exactly. don't like that confrontation. So they'd rather sell the property than go to the yeah. residents and say, I need to increase your rents by 150 bucks. That's so. crazy though, right? That's <laughs> insane. That's really true. A lot of sellers are selling just because they're uncomfortable and it's because they didn't really probably want to be a landlord. And I think when you get into multifamily, you have to accept like being a landlord is a business. It's not a side job. Being a landlord is important. You're caretaking people, but they're caretaking your house. And that's why you have to have a good relationship. Not not too good so they call you when their light bulbs are out, but good so that what I say is just, you know, I want to know right away if it's if it's fire or water. Anything else can probably wait. Fire or water, I'd like a call right away. And that's how I think you you have to nurture those relationships. And I think that's what a lot of landlords miss because they're looking at as, you know, I'm just going to make income and passive income, but the better your relationship with the tenants, the easier it is to get those rent rent raises uh, and the better your property is going to be kept. No, great stuff, Jonathan. So, I mean, we're talking more about going direct to owners right now and some of these different tactics. Let's rewind it back because a lot of our listeners are trying to do that first deal. And the way I started, I know this is something you're passionate about. I started with the house hat. You know, I started with the duplex. I lived in one unit, rented out the other. It actually took me a while to get going on that house hack. And I was very fortunate to find a real estate agent who had experience as not just an agent, but also as an investor and also as a, a contractor. So I had this person who could look at these properties with me, identify things that maybe I was going to completely miss, and he could help me navigate that first deal, and that first property. When you're talking to potential investors who are in that same space that maybe I was in, um, what are some of the challenges that they face? And particularly in that one or two to four unit range, what are some of the ways that they could be more effective if they are looking to go for a house hack? 
Yeah, uh, perfect. Great question. And thanks. This is really one of our specialties. We work with tons of house hackers all the time, but it's it's not as easy as I think people think. And you probably know that. And you got lucky because you had a good agent. 99% of real estate agents have no idea what house hacking is or how to do it or how to evaluate it or how to understand what the long-term implications of the Wait property minute, will be. You telling me I just can't call my cousin's best friend <laughs> sister and have yeah. her be my real estate agent for my house hack? That they will say they know, but they won't know. And I think that's what, you know, that's one of the hardest parts about being a new investor and trying to figure out house hacks. So I'll give you a couple tips that I think are invaluable. So especially if you're if you're a single person or just a couple and you're looking to house hack, most of the time you want to maximize the money because your plan is to use an FHA and only live there for a year. So you can uh, you you want I always say I'm looking for them for uneven multis. And when I say uneven multis, I mean more units in one side, less units in the other, up or down, whatever it is. Because the problem is a lot of times your agents or people are just looking and you're always looking at whatever, two bedrooms and one bath on each side, but that's a waste of money if you're just one person. What do you need two bedrooms for? You're trying to house hack and make money. You want a three over one or you know a border unit or something that you can live in or what we call a two plus one, which is a legal two family with an extra unit that as the owner occupant, you can live in likely without a stove. That's how you make money house hacking. And I think if you deal with agents who don't understand, they're just going to keep sending you like kind of regular side by side or up and down. But it's a waste of space and a waste of money if your whole idea is like, I want to grin and bear it for a year and make more money. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's one tip. Uh, also, I think the biggest mistake, like you were saying, if we just use, you know, Bob and Sally realtor down the street, uh, understanding what the tenancy is like we talked about. And then the evaluating the rent roll is really, really important. This is just maybe a tip for agents and for in investors who are looking to house hack. When you're doing comps on a multifamily and you're running them in the MLS, hopefully your agent is, the most important thing is that one, you're searching the exact bedrooms and bath of the units that you have. So say you have two, two bed, one bath units, you're going to search two bed, one bath units back three months. If you're in an area where there's not a ton of multis, you're going to search back six months. The most important thing is that you then only look for rentals in multifamilies. What people make a mistake on comps, which then adjusts how much cash flow you're going to get is they just search two one units and then they get a bunch of apartments in. Apartments and multifamily units are not comparable apartments have much more amenities. They have concierge services, parking, all these things. And some MLSs don't even have a way to separate the two. On mine, you can just do units in a multifamily. That's like kind. And those will be less than the apartment rents. So if you do them together, unfortunately, what happens a lot of the time is you're going to get a comparable rent estimation for the other unit that's going to be too high. And if you're $250 too high, that's a lot of cash flow you lose off the top. You're counting your cash flow at, you know, 400 and then that rent roll is wrong and you're down to 150, you know, then a furnace breaks and you're not making money for two years. So, yeah, you just dropped a lot of knowledge and I, I got to rewind this back and almost slow roll it, man. Uh, you know, you, you're giving like insights by the minute <laughs> and it's almost too fast and too good so let me play back some of this right the first thing you talked about was when you are looking to house hack you said uneven units and i, I didn't quite know what you meant at first but i get it completely what, what jonathan is saying is that instead of looking for uh, a duplex or a two unit property that has three bedrooms, two baths on each side, or two bedrooms, one bath on each side. That's certainly fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you really want to create value, if you could find a property that has a finished basement, a finished attic unit, maybe a studio or one bed, one bath unit, any other units are larger, you can rent those other larger units. If it's just you, live in that small living space. Go ahead and you know tough it out. Rent that small living space rent or rent out the bigger ones so you can maximize the cash flow. You live in a smaller space for a house hack, especially if you're doing an FHA loan, you only have to live in it for one year and a day. So you can move out after that and then rent that space if you want to someone else. Uh, but that's a great way to maximize value. The second thing you talked about was looking at um, comps. And this is critical. And this is not just for uh, multifamily, smaller multifamily. I think this is critical of any kind of comp uh, process. And a lot of times when we are looking at comps, even for apartment buildings, 
we have to really dig in because a lot of people don't look at comps the right way. And what you said was very key. When you're looking at multifamily comps, these are smaller properties that don't have a lot of amenities. You cannot look at that and compare it to a larger apartment complex that may have a pool and may have you know, a, a fitness center and all these other things. People are paying a premium for those amenities. And if you have zero amenities at your three unit property, you can't expect to get the same amount of rent that this newer property, this larger apartment building is getting. So you have to really focus on the apples to apples comparison. Start with the unit mix or the, the bedroom and bathroom mix. And then you want to actually look at, does this property have these kind of amenities? Is it a small multifamily? Is that a large multifamily? And then sometimes, you know, unfortunately, you may not find other properties that do feel like a great comp. What do you do then, Jonathan? If you've got a, you know, you're, you've got a, a three unit property, it's the only three unit property or property of that type that you can see in the comps. What do you do to try to get a fair rec recognition of what the market should be? Yeah, oh, great question. I think it's super helpful to figure these things out because these are things where investors fail. So for me, I always start at three months back as a time frame and only about a half mile. And then each time I don't find enough comps, I just start to expand both. Maybe I go to six months back and then I stretch out to a mile. If you're in a rural area, you're going to have to stretch out more. And then it's just not going to be as reliable. Maybe you go from like 80% confidence to maybe 75, but you're still hedging your bets. Like if, there, if you're in an area where there's no multis, you can't comp it. I mean, you literally can't. You have to really look at whatever you can. I'd look at single house, single family home rentals quicker than I would look at apartment rentals if I was doing a multi. And then I would kind of cut those by the bedrooms because I just think, like you were saying, they're just two completely different products and they get lumped together as rentals. And that's the huge problem in evaluation just from a mom and pop point of view. Because like you said, there's no pools, there's no like Amazon Dropbox, you know, like your laundry is like in not a nice basement, you know, it's probably not coin operated. Nobody knows what's going on. You know, your storage possibly gets water. This is multifamily living. And I think, again, it's another thing that you have to know uh, going into it. If you don't mind, I just wanted to touch on one thing from the two plus one, which we're talking about. Like, So if you do choose to live in what is like an illegal unit, uh, one of the most things that you really need to remember is that when you move out after your FHA and that unit sometimes won't be able to be just rented on its own. A lot of times you can, but technically it might be illegal. So sometimes we're seeing, we'll end up renting that attic or basement unit to either the second floor or the first floor as an add-on. So you won't get the same amount, but you'll still get more cash flow. So it's important to know in the jurisdiction you're in what they're okay with. But a lot of people are able in areas that are just, that they let you rent additional dwelling units uh, and the basement as long as they're done the right way, no, no stove uh, in an illegal unit. Yeah, great tips there. Thank you for clarifying that. Sure. I think the other thing too is just understand with comps, you're never going to find, I mean, well, it's very rare to find the exact comp that's going to tell you exactly what to list it for, where it's going to move, right? So yeah. you're trying to gather and cobble together pieces of information so you can move forward with a certain amount of confidence. So, you know, to your point, sometimes you might have to look at single family houses. Maybe you do have to look at the apartment complexes, but you need to now account for the different amenities that they have. And if I can help you with the thinking of the process, as opposed to just the tactical stuff we're talking about here. The thinking is, if you were a prospective renter, what would you be looking for? And would you compare this property to your property or that property to your property? Like what's going to be in the competitive set? And if this property has a bunch of different amenities, well, is that the same kind of renter that you're targeting or is this going to be a different kind of renter, right? right. So that, that's the thought process and the logic behind what Jonathan's getting into. Jonathan, we, we kind of, um, we started talking about the agent and making sure you've got a quality agent who knows what they're doing. How do you actually figure out whether or not this agent is the right agent to help you find this property? I mean, they can follow what you did, even if you got lucky. I mean, you really need to find an investor friendly agent. And I know because I was investing for 30 years before I was licensed and I would go. They just didn't know anything. They didn't answer any of my questions. They didn't understand what my focus is, what the potential appreciation was, you know, what rent rolls for commercial, what cap rate, everything like that. Um, and so when I, I created a team, I have a big on market team of 25 agents um, and we're investor friendly. It doesn't mean that we don't work 
regular deals. It just means that we understand every purchase is an investment. So for me, I just like you did, I want somebody, if I'm looking at house hack, I want an agent who has invested or likely has house hacked. And I have several agents on my team who are house hacking or who have house hacked because how much better can you feel if you know someone has done it as opposed to a regular agent or somebody who has never even thought about that. Uh, but more so, it makes you feel more comfortable. They understand what you're looking for. And the one thing that I'll say, and maybe you had this experience too, if you're working with a, an investor-friendly agent who also invests, they don't mind looking at dumps. You know, they, it's fun. So when people say like, oh, I'm sorry, we had to look at these properties. I'm like, I will literally look at any property. I'm an investor. I like to look at everything. If it doesn't work for you, maybe it works for someone else. Or maybe I can learn something about how bad construction is done or an interesting thing in a multi. I saw two yesterday with a client. One was a disaster. One was really good. And, but I, you know, me 30 years in, I'm still like, I, I can learn something. I think that's the biggest thing. If you're an investor and you're looking for your first property or you want a house hack, or you're just looking for your third or fourth property and you go with the regular agent, they don't want to go into those murky type of flip properties. You know, They want to do what's easier. And being an investor-friendly agent is not easy, but when you find the agent that works, everything becomes easier uh, overall and then more comfortable. Yeah. I think it helps to be clear on what you're looking for, meaning that um, are you looking for a house hack property where you can move in, have a nice home and just have your rents, you know, your mortgage or your rent subsidized, or are you looking to create value, do a value add deal, go in there, right. do some renovations, construction, and you've got to find somebody who understands that, understands the numbers behind that and can really help navigate that process with you, especially if this is your first time, because yep. I, I'll tell you, if you don't have the experience, you can listen to all the podcasts in, in the world, all the read, all the books, you can talk to as many people. Until it's your money and you're pulling the trigger and you're putting your name down, I mean, that that butterfly in, in the stomach, when it captures you, when you're like, oh, man, am I really going to do this? It's tough. And you need somebody in your corner who can reassure you that, hey, you're doing the right thing. We've looked at it. We've got a plan. Even if something goes wrong, here's what we're going to do. It's helpful to have that person. If you've yeah. got an agent who only does really nice stuff, you know, higher end finishes, when they walk in. They will not sell you. They will not be confident in the property. And they're going to be, they're going to be making you question yourself. So yeah. you definitely want to make sure you have that investor friendly agent who can help you walk through that process because it's just going to make your life much easier. Yeah. I, I, I really think uh, just going off what you said, you, I think you need someone, whether it's an agent or someone, and you need someone who's always going to tell you the truth when you're an investor. There's so many new investors who are just getting yes along, like, yeah, just do the deal, get it done. You know, yes, just get it like that. I, I tell people no all the time because I think it's going to help them long term. And I think initially it's off putting because they say, hey, look, I found the deal of the century. I said, this is the worst deal I've ever seen. And they say, oh, you're being mean. I'm like, I mean, I'm trying to save you money. So don't do the deal. It's a bad deal instead of rushing into it. But I think working with investors and doing like, you know, we do a bunch of investor meetups on Zoom. And I think that's what really helps people feel more comfortable. Because yeah. when you're a, when you're a house hacker and not only you have an investor friendly agent, but you're on, you know, meetups with 10 other people trying to house hack, it doesn't seem that hard, but you're also not inclined to get yes along all the time because there's other people who's like, no, I tried that that doesn't work. I screwed up. And I think the real life relationships, again, going back to where we started on the off market on building relationships, to me, everything in investing is building relationships. And if you do it the right way, you get more comfortable, you meet the right people, you definitely meet the wrong people, you know, in real estate, because there's a lot of people selling stuff, and you have to know what's real and who's in it for the right reasons. Yeah, great stuff there. Um, one of the other issues that a lot of investors face, especially starting out, is figuring out which market they want to invest in. If you're in the East Coast, West Coast, you might be priced out of your local market. Um, whether you're, you know, in a city that maybe is investor friendly, not investor friendly, figuring out the market selection is tough. And as a matter of fact, I mean that that's the origin of this show. This show mm -hmm. started as target market insights to help people find the best places to invest. Uh, because it was the thing that I struggled with the most. Even when I finally got it figured out, then the numbers changed in that same neighborhood that I loved. I couldn't find the deals in it. So I had to keep moving and looking. So I felt like I was constantly going through this process. What do you say? I mean, how, how do you help people find the right places to invest and select the right markets? 
Yeah. And I knew thinking target market insights, I knew I would have this for you because I know you're going to like it. So there's something that I do differently. So for me, if I'm a brand new investor, uh, I don't know a lot, you know, I, I need help. But what I want to do for myself is I want to find a location where I have some competitive advantage. And the way that I do that is I have investors make a list right away. So too many people are like looking at lists of hottest markets, best places to invest that you're, you're too late. You're too late on all those and you don't know anything. So you're starting from scratch. So first I have them make a list of every place that they've ever lived that they can remember, just because then they have a competitive advantage of actually knowing the streets and the landscape. So when you get sent property, you're like, oh, actually that was around the corner from my old school. Second is all the places they've obviously gone to school, which is part of living. But then part two is make a list of where your closest friends and family live, the ones that you like not the ones that you don't like, not cousin Sally, who's so annoying, all the ones that you would trust to say, hey, is there any way you could just run by with the agent and take a look at this and be an extra set of eyes? And I think if you take those, all the places you've lived, the places where your best friends and family lived, and then you take that data and you start to look at where hot markets are. And to me, the way that I look at hot markets, if I see a hot market and it says, uh, I don't know, uh, Tallahassee, Florida or something. I'm uh, everyone knows about Tallahassee. So I go to the map and I'm looking for two, three towns around the biggest town. And then I start running data on those towns because I want to make money. <laughs> like, and I think people are thinking too hard, but if you, if you're a first time investor and you have no competitive advantage, you're really relying on everybody else. And I think that's how a lot of people lose their money. There's a lot of good funnels you can build, but if you build the wrong funnel, you will lose your money. I mean, people do it literally every single day. So that's like the way that I suggest doing target markets, because what better way? I, everyone says like, I want to be in a hot market. Every market's hot if you know the numbers. So why not be in one where you actually know the streets? You'll just be so much better off or have a friend or family member who knows the streets who can say, no, this there's a development going in. I know someone in, on the city board and then you have advanced information. And boom, just phenomenal <laughs> insights right there. And, uh, you know, to replay a little bit of it, first of all, for cousin Sally, we love you. It's not, it's <laughs> yeah, nothing personal. still like you, but Sally. don't trust yeah. you to look at the property. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you said a couple of things there. First and foremost, you know, don't necessarily focus on the, the hot markets, right? The hot 25 list. We see them all the time. There's some great cities, some great metros on that list. But if you live in Anchorage, Alaska, don't try to you know, invest in Orlando, Florida and think you're going to have a competitive advantage over people who live there. Right. Um, I think the other piece to it is um, figure out where you have an advantage. Where have you lived? Where do you have family? Where do you have some ties and some connections where you can get people you trust to go look at these properties, give you feedback on the locations, the neighborhoods and things like that? I think it's just great feedback there. The other thing is, if you're in one of these markets, especially if it's a hot market, don't necessarily just go to the hottest submarket in that hot market, but try to find the neighboring areas that look great. This is exactly what we did with our second investment because I could no longer invest in the, the neighborhood in Chicago I was investing in. The prices just shot up way too high. It was great for the property I already owned, not so great for the acquisition side. And what we ended up doing was we found a neighborhood that we knew was hot, one of those neighborhoods that a lot of people love. And instead of focusing on that area, we actually went to the adjacent town and realized they had a lot of the same amenities. It had a lot of the same things people loved about that neighborhood. Uh, it was just more affordable. And guess what? Exactly. There were some new developments happening in that area. There's a new grocery store that was going up a block away from where we ended up buying this property. So we ended up buying that property doing really well. And that is a strategy that works extremely well. Um, you know, when we first launched the show, we put together a, a free download. We still have that available. Happy to share it. But it's 35 hacks to help you find the best places to invest. And that was one of the, the hacks that's in that download is trying to figure out where the development's happening, find out where the hot neighborhood is and actually don't invest there, but go adjacent exactly. to it. And not just adjacent to adjacent, you got to pick the right adjacent. So you have to figure out which place has the same characteristics, right? If you're moving further away from the train, well, that's the wrong way. You know, you need to stay, understand what's driving it. Is it the infrastructure? Is it transportation? Is it jobs? Is it nightlife? What's driving it? What's adjacent? That's how you land on that, that sub market there. So just phenomenal insights there. And we love it and just think that it's a pillar of how you need to be thinking about investing in selected markets. Yeah, I appreciate it. And I also think it gives you more power as a new investor to be selective instead of just relying on everybody else. Like 
if you just focus on where you, 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 and even if you have competitive advantages, like you're really good at data, then you can use that to your advantage. But too many people are just going in trusting everyone. And that's just a very bad thing to do when you're new. Uh, sometimes you get it right. You know, if you get the right funnel, but a lot of times it, it goes wrong. And by the time everyone's talking about something, like you said, it might be way too, too late, late or, you know, you got to understand what do they know? So if you can get ahead of that a little bit, you can get more, more of the upside. So Jonathan, for folks who want to learn more about you, the work you're doing, the, the coaching that you do with other clients, what's the best way for them to reach out? So our website is at streamlined with a D dot properties. And then you can find me all over social on Instagram. My Instagram is trust green with an E at the end. And then the, the company is streamlined properties, all one on Instagram. And then through there, you'll find my YouTube. I put a lot of content this year, probably making about a video a day on YouTube. Uh, it's for investors, uh, for also for agents and uh, buyers, regular home sellers. It's really just real estate content all the time. Uh, and I mean, if real real estate content like you, you tell people like how it is. And I think that it's hard because real estate, there's so much fluff out there that we really want to cut through. And the advice that you can get you know, from people like us and a lot of other people that I've heard you interview is like, this is the real advice that you need to not go and make a mistake. So those are the best spots. Um, if anyone wants to get in touch with me, they can send an email, but I will be honest, it's going to go to my team success manager. This is why I'm productive, which may go to your questions at the end, but it's info at streamlined.properties and then she'll forward it to me uh, and I'll get it through there. Give me a failure or an apparent failure that sets you up for later success. Yeah, so I, I built my first real estate team and it was not the way I wanted to. I learned everything that I did wrong by building it wrong the first way. I've done the same in investing, but the team really helped me build this team the right way because I just didn't do it with the right mindset. It wasn't built around culture, values and accountability. It was built around sales and we don't do anything based around sales. All we're doing is building a culture um, and making sure that we're building relationships. The rest of the stuff all happens by itself. Give me a digital or mobile resource you recommend for your business. Uh, so I would say HomeBot, at least for me. HomeBot is great for investors. Uh, we have a portal which I can send to you that people can use through us. It's totally free. There's no spam. Uh, HomeBot for sellers and buyers. For sellers, HomeBot will send you a monthly update on how much your house is worth, but also how much equity you have. So it'll keep running your mortgage versus the, the rates to show you how much equity to see when you can take off and use some of that for an investment. And then on the buyer side for HomeBot, we use it for our investors. It gives you a heat map of all the areas you like that identifies whether it's a buyer's or seller's market. So we're able to look and scale over that. When you see a buyer's market, especially now as things change a little, you're gonna look for the heat map to get a little cooler in the area for the sellers and then target those areas. Give me the book you've recommended or gifted the most in the last year. It's definitely Who Not How by Dan Sullivan. Uh, I, I have a problem. I need to read it a second and third time now because I keep doing everything myself. And part of what I was just saying about the email is part of Who Not How. Um, so I'm really learning in my personal life and in business, everything that I don't like to do or is I can use my time better. I need to have someone else do it for me. Give me a daily habit that helps you stay focused on your goals. Uh, well, a lot of people say meditation. That is for me as well, but I'm actually going to say spreadsheets. I track every single thing that I do. I track how much I read, how much I meditate, how much I work out, how much I learn, listen to podcasts. Every minute that I listen to podcasts, I note. And at the end of the year, each year, I'm able to look back. I do that with my team as well. Uh, when everything, so I'm like a spreadsheet fanatic, but I like spreadsheets because they allow me to be self accountable to the metrics. So if I haven't worked out, I can see all the zeros on there and then I feel embarrassed. And, but I, when I have tracking seven things, I know, okay, I meditated, I read, and I listened to an hour of podcast today. So even if I don't work out, I'm like, I mean, this is a pretty good day. So I, I, it allows me to not be as hard on myself, but also to track and know that I'm always moving forward um, in my life. Is, is it one spreadsheet that just has the different activities and you just check them have, off or is it like multiple no. pages or something? Yeah. So my coaching spreadsheet has like a hundred tabs. It literally has everything, but my personal spreadsheet is seven columns and then I record the minutes each day. So it has every day and then the minutes get recorded and they get auto tabulated for each month. So I can see if I'm up or down each month balanced against what I have done in the prior years, which I really, I really look at it. as I get older, I like to see, I want to make sure that I'm 
always in growth mode, which for me is just really learning podcasts, masterclass, YouTube. Uh, and I record it because I want to look at the end of the day. Like I think the last three days I have over a hundred minutes of learning each day because a lot of time I'm riding in the car. What do I do? Listen to music or I'm listening to you, your podcast. I'm going to listen to the podcast. I'm going to learn more. So, Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, we, we hear about productivity planners and things like that and trackers, but I've never heard of someone create their own and just sounds like you got a pretty meticulous system to update and track it. So that's really cool. It's crazy. I'm a little crazy on that. <laughs> All right. Uh, give me something that, um, you know, you're curious about right now. Uh, I am really interested in what I call Main Street commercial or Main Street multi-use. It's basically your hybrid mixed use on Main Streets. Like, so in a town on the biggest street, uh, I feel like they're really undervalued properties. I love seeing a, a storefront or two, like maybe attorney type offices with a unit on top. I think that's the direction that I'm gonna go in, especially where I live now, I, they're just available. There's a lot of them available. So I'm looking at the metrics and uh, listening to a lot of things recently, I'm seeing how those could potentially be moved into seller financing options, just because they're usually paid off. There's very, very much trouble getting commercial renters on Main Street right now. So I'm trying to figure out, can I get these properties, turn them into income producing properties, but also assist in the revitalization of a town that would be like a you know triple win for me. And a little less competition from other buyers too. So lots of exactly. opportunities there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, give me your number one insight for multifamily investing. Uh, I think it was the, the data that I was talking about. For multifamily investing, I think there's nothing more important than having an agent who understands the data. Um, nothing, because if if you're doing all the work yourself, you're not getting the expertise that you need. You want to be working as a team and there's nothing more in value, especially scaling up into the 20 units and above. You really, of course, you probably know what you're doing if you've been doing it a while. But if you're new and you have the cash to go 20 units, you better have someone who can evaluate all the potential pitfalls of the whole project while you're in there. Uh, and that only comes from experience. You know, it really does. I think that's really the team building thing that you need um, to, to succeed in multifamily is having someone there who can uh, keep you in check as an agent. <laughs> All right, we're gonna lighten the mood a little bit here. So I, I know you live in Mendham now, but you used to live in Montclair, New Jersey. Give me the best place to grab a bite to eat. Uh, it's definitely La Salbuen. It's on Walnut Street, which is a great street in Montclair. It's a tiny restaurant. There's probably, I think there's, seven tables the food's just the best there's a lot of great places to eat in montclair but that was my go-to for years um i like small restaurants i just think it and, and i like local you know i like it's it's just a husband and wife team from the area and that just uh really works for me awesome give me your email address one more time for listeners who want to get in touch with you yeah so if they're going to send it through it's info at streamlined with a d dot properties that will go to my team success manager crystal and she'll send it to me it's not that i don't want everybody's emails it's because i'm practicing who not how and if i get my email is i get 150 to 200 emails a day and i'm trying to figure out a best way to to be able to respond proactively and the, correctly on time <laughs> Makes sense. Listen, Jonathan, lots of great information today. I really like how you talked about, first of all, you know, going direct to owners, understanding some of the marketing strategies and tactics there. The difference is when it comes to negotiating and setting that stage, building the relationship and what it takes to, you know, work with uh, property owners from a multifamily standpoint versus single family. You also talked about house hacking, getting the right agent and how to find the right market for investing. Great tips all along. Thank you gave us a lot of great information for this episode. Jonathan, I just want to thank you again for one, being an avid listener of the show and two, being a phenomenal guest. We look forward to building on the connection and hope to stay in touch. Talk to you soon. Yeah. Appreciate it, John. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.